And a person had wrote a letter to the editor of a newspaper and complained that it made no sense to go to church every Sunday. Doesn't make any sense at all. He said, I've gone, to, I've gone for over 30 years now, and in that time I've heard something like 3,000 sermons. But for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. So I think I'm wasting my time. The preachers, the priests, they're wasting theirs too by giving us all these sermons. This started a real controversy in the letters to the editor in that column. And much to the delight of the editor, it went on for some weeks until someone wrote this clincher. He says, I've been married for 30 years now, and in that time, my wife has cooked some 32,000 meals. But for the life of me, I can't recall the entire menu <laughs> for one of the, a single one of those meals. But I do know this. They all nourished me and gave me the strength I needed to do my work. If my wife had not given me those meals, I would be physically dead today. Likewise, if I had not gone to church for nourishment, I would be spiritually dead today. When you are down to nothing, God is up to something. Let me read that again. When you are down to nothing, God is up to something. Can you say amen? amen? Yes, we need both the physical nourishment, but we also, because we are spirit beings that live in a body. We have a soul, a, a spirit, and a mind, and a will. And so we need both physical nourishment and we need spiritual nourishment. Well, I can stay home and get that. Well, you can get some, that's for sure. But you cannot get the fellowship that's also needed for your spiritual growth and your spiritual nourishment. Amen. God does not just tell us to assemble together together. Uh, Hebrews 10.25, like it says, just for His benefit, it's also for our benefit. Amen? Amen. You know, God is God, and God's complete in how He is. In a, on the one hand, God doesn't need anything, does He? No. All He's got to do is speak, and He can make all kinds of things, but He doesn't need that. What He was after was heart love from those who would be created in His likeness and image. Now, He created angels. He created the spirit world. He's created spirit beings. He created a lot of things. But He wanted something even more, and that was us. And He created us to be at a level even higher than the angels, and we fell to a level lower than that, seduced by the devil. In Acts 10, 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the day. We ask, Lord, that of your blessing and anointing, O God, that we might speak of the unsearchable riches of God hidden in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we want that to be revealed to all who come around, Lord, that they may discover and know how great and wonderful you are. And the gift of God when you gave Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, you didn't send your Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Being an overcomer. Now we know in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, seven times there, Jesus speaks to seven different churches. And he tells them, some he commends, some he, um, he rebukes, he reproves, because they were getting things out of sort. And one of the things, if you've been in church for a long time, you've been going to church and everything, it can become sometimes, you know, just kind of old hat. You know, you know exactly what's going to go. You know, they're going. Um, we're going to sing three songs. Uh, we're going to take up the offering. The preacher's going to preach some message. We'll pat each other on the back and go home. Click, click, click. You know. And uh, I had a drug problem when I was a little kid. Mama drugged me to church every time the doors was open. You know about that, Reggie? Yes, sir. Your mama did that too, huh? 
Yeah, and I walked the aisle when I was 11 years old. I got baptized in 1953. Oh, yeah, yeah. But then I got, became a teenager, and everything went down the drain. Oh, my. Begin to live in the world and act like the world and everything. All the while, still going to church. Because Mama's going to make sure you go to church. Oh, yeah. But you can be in the building, and you can be in church, per se, but not have church in you. Amen. Come on. Yes. Sir. Yes. You can be there, but not have Him with you. And Jesus said this in John 14, 12 through 15, Verily, verily, when you, when you see that spoken twice, that means of an absolute truth. Jesus is saying something to get our attention. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Do you believe in Jesus? Turn to somebody and ask them. Do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. He said, the works, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. He or she, that means both. And greater works than these shall he or she do, because I go to the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Amen. If you will ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, here we go, here we go, here we go. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Let me ask you a question. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, are they called to be converts or disciples? Disciples. Oh, you mean we're not in it? This is not a spectator sport? This is not a spectator thing? You mean we're supposed to be actively involved? We're supposed to be down on the field, aren't we? We're not supposed to be sitting up in the stands, even though we might clap and shout and holler. We're to be one of the actual participants in the game. Only this isn't a game. People's lives are hanging in the balance. All believers are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Yes, they are. Well, what if a person or someone wants to be a believer, but only wants to be halfway, lukewarm? Will they get a whole salvation out of that? No. <laughs> Oh, my, my, my. Revelation 3, 14 through 22 says, And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. You know, we had been going out yesterday, Jan and I, and, and we traveled all the way down the west side, went all the way um, down to Orange Park, and we went to this big pottery barn place, you know, I don't know if any of y'all know, down there by uh, Blanding and Kingsley, you know, we went in there, and it's huge, and we wandered all over that place, and and uh, finally, eventually, we made our way back home, and, and she fixed me something with lots of ice in it, and brought that in there to me, and I mean to tell you, it was ice cold, and it was absolutely delicious. Oh, yes, it was. You know what I'm talking about? Something that's ice cold when you're hot and sweaty, you know, and you've been walking up and down the aisles and everything. Of course, feet hurting too, but that didn't matter. And where she said, all right, we're going to go this way. I said, come on, let's go. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it was so wonderful, so good, so sweet. There's times when the cold is the thing that we really want to get, isn't it? And there's times when we want something hot too, right? But the Lord is, he, it, when it comes to us being a believer in Him, He says, I would that you be one or the other. Be something. Don't just be, eh. eh. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Eh. Say it. Eh. Eh. Yeah. Don't be just, eh. Lukewarm. He said, I know your works. You're neither hot or cold, or cold or hot. I would that you was cold or hot. Verse 16, so then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, he says, I'm going to vomit you out of me. Whoa, wait a minute. you got to be in Jesus to be vomited out of Jesus, don't you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. See, just because you are in church, that don't mean... You're a true believer. 
You know, I've seen on Facebook things. I get into Facebook like a lot of us do and, and look at things. And, and I've had contact with people and family members through Facebook that I normally would never see. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, you, they, somebody posts something or something. You say, oh, my goodness, I've not heard from that person in a long time. And um, you can get things like that from time to time and uh, find out about them. But you, you need to be able to make contact with people, to see them, to share with them, to know them, to give words of, of encouragement or sharing or something like that. And he says, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of me. Because you say you're rich and you're increased with goods and you have need of nothing and knowest not that there are, are, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now that's a, in a bad state, isn't it? Yeah. Ain't got no clothes on. You think you're fine, but you're so sick you don't even realize it. You're miserable. You're wretched. You're in poverty. See, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way of the world. And people are like that. And they go flying along and patting their self on the back. I'm perfectly fine. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this room is half empty today because believers out there that, that would have come here, they stayed away from here this morning by the thousands. And that's no joke in a way because if they really knew what I know, they'd be flocking into this place. Flocking into any church out here that names the name of Jesus. There would be a, every church in this whole North Jacksonville, North Florida, South Georgia area would be slammed full to overflow. The streets would be blocked by people trying to get in the door if they knew. But they don't know. And they're not going to know by coming into the church just on a per se basis. Why won't they? Because they don't know. Where, what, what have we got to do? We got to go where they are. That's right. That's right. Amen. And what Garfield and Jennifer did last Sunday and others in here, you are doing the same kinds of things, going out into the community, giving a testimony of Jesus Christ that God is still God and He still cares about people's lives. That's right. Amen. Amen. Now, when we do those prayer stations out there, we're not pro, uh, promoting Believer's Joy Worship Center that much. We're promoting Jesus Christ. That's, right, yeah. That's who we're promoting. And, and along the way, if they ask us what, where, where we go to church or whatever, we can tell them that and everything. But unless they find Jesus Christ, they've lost everything. Amen. Because there's an end coming. There is an end coming. Scientists know now that 100% of all people die. Everybody in this room has got a death sentence on them. One day, if the Lord tarries, guess what's going to happen to your body? It's going to quit working. It'll quit working and you'll come right out of it. And there's only two places to go. You're either going to go up or you're going to go down. There's no in between. There's no purgatory. That was a lie of the devil. You're either going to go to be with God, and the only way you get to go would be with God is to have made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And there's people right now below our feet, right here in Jacksonville, Florida, right out here beside Yellow Bluff Road, there's people down there right now begging God to give them another chance. I was going to do it, Lord. I was really going to do it. My first wife's granddaddy, Jack Green, kept telling Brother Jim, I'm going to do it. I'll do it before I die. That's what he would tell him. I'm going to do it before I die. Well, he never saw the pulpwood truck that hit on his door when he went through the intersection that killed him. He leaned down. To tie, he noticed that the shoestring on his shoe was untied. And as he leaned down while they're going through the intersection to tie his shoe, he got killed. Jack Green was his name. That was Miss Eva's maiden name. It was her daddy. 
And Brother Jim, who started this church in 1965 over in Highlands, and then they bought this land and moved here in 1966, over and over and over and over, he tried to get his father-in-law to commit his life to Christ. And every single time he would say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Now maybe he did, but we never saw it according to what the family says. I'm going to do it before I die. Do you think people was praying for him? Of course they were. But see, we have our will, and God will not violate your will. Under no circumstances will he do that. And everybody has a choice. I counsel you, you this is what Jesus is saying, in verse 18, Revelation chapter 3, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And I learned a long time ago that every single one of us are going to be tested unto death. Are you really and truly a true in your heart of hearts a believer in Jesus Christ and are seeking to live in such a way that you're obeying Him? And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you can say I believe in Jesus all day long, but if you don't obey God, you're lying to yourself. Amen. Just because you sit in a garage somewhere, that don't make you a Volkswagen. And you can sit in church all your life and end up going to hell. And that was one of the things that when I seen on Facebook where people had put in instances where they died on the operating table or they died in the rescue unit on the way to the hospital and while they were dying and dead in their body, while they was working on their body, they went to hell. And said the place was racking and rolling with people crying out to God, give me another chance, Lord. I really meant to do it. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. Help me. Even Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man down there in torment was begging for one single drop of water on his lips because I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham tells him, you can't come to us. We can't go to you. There's a great gulf fixed. He said, yeah, but I got five brothers. Let somebody go back and tell them. And Abraham said, if they won't believe the prophets and the word of God, they won't believe if somebody comes back from the dead. And what's his name that came back from the dead? Jesus. What's his name? Lazarus. Well, Lazarus, yeah, but Jesus Christ. Oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the one that <laughs> rose the first fruits of the resurrection. Praise the Lord. And so, ladies and gentlemen, he's saying, buy of me. And he tells us in Isaiah chapter 57, I think, 57, 58, buy of me, buy of me without money. As far as coins or paper money or anything, buy with faith in Jesus Christ. Commit your heart and minds and lives to Christ. Gold tried in the fire. See, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to be tested as to your faith. Will you obey God? The Bible says that we're not even to give the appearance. Not even the appearance of that which is wrong. I see people everywhere, all over the place, and in this world anymore. Marriage means nothing. Marriage is a covenant. It is a blood covenant. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were naked. Their clothing of light disappeared the moment they bit. Click, the light turned off. And they knew they were naked. And where did they put the fig leaves? Right over their private parts. And you know what happens to fig leaves when they dry up? They curl up and there you are uncovered all over again. Yeah. God kicked them out. You've sinned and you will die. But they committed their life to God's provision. How did God clothe them? He killed some animals and skinned those animals because blood was shed. Leviticus 23, excuse me, Leviticus 17 tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. And see, you can have a perfectly good body, perfectly good heart, perfectly good organs, perfectly good everything. You spring a leak and you'll be dead in a little while. 
because it's that blood that carries life around in your body. It carries that oxygen that we need constantly and over and over and over and over and over again every single day. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So God established a blood covenant for marriage. And He put a piece of skin on a man's reproductive organs and He put a piece of skin in a woman's reproductive organs. And He intended for marriage to be a blood covenant. A blood covenant, ladies and gentlemen. And that's exactly what marriage was to be. And it's supposed to be. But the devil hates blood covenants. When Jesus shed His blood, the Bible tells us, had they known in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, had the principalities of this world known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Amen. Because in doing so, they cut their own throat for eternity. Sure. They think, oh, we'll kill him. We'll get rid of him. We'll be done with this Messiah. But see, God had a plan, and He did not tell the devil what the plan was. Because if they had known, they wouldn't have done it. And when that blood was shed at Calvary's cross, and see, we're here today to have communion, which represents the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And it's by His stripes that we are and were healed. Isaiah 53, verse 5, 1 Peter 2, 24. By His blood and stripes, we're healed. And as we're studying on Wednesday night, if you won't believe that God's already done it for us, whatever it is that you need, you're not going to get it. Come on! That was a good place to say amen. amen. Because if you won't believe God, you're not going to get it. For he that comes to God must believe that God is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I counsel for you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, white raiment that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear. By the way, people in hell don't wear clothes. And they don't care one iota about the person next door that don't have any clothes on because they're stripped naked. I don't know if you knew that. Doesn't make a bit of difference. But see, God clothes us. Even when we pass out of this life into the next, we're never naked. Never. Never. And we're clothed with righteousness. Buy of me white raiment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness does not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I stand at the door and knock. Now, in this particular church, the church of Laodicea, he's saying, I'm removing the candlestick out of this place because you think you're rich and you are nothing. You're nothing. If you go through those seven churches, you'll find that he rebuked from the first to the last. But he commended those who were heart faith people. They went through the trials and they went through the tribulations. They went through things and they were tested. And we're going to be tested as to whether or not our faith is real. Amen? Amen? Oh, you get outside these walls and you get out there in that world and you say the name of Jesus, somebody will spit in your face. You could say Muhammad. You could say Sun Young Moon. You could say Buddha. You could say anything you want to and get away with it and they pat you on the back. Start saying the name of Jesus and see what happens. Amen. That's right. There's only one name in this world that the devil hates and that's the name of Jesus. And anybody else that also names that name. I mean what Garfield and Jennifer was talking about when they faced several of those demons. Oh yeah. I walk around sometimes in different places and we go to a shopping center or whatever and I can look and I say, Jan, do you think that person over there is homosexual? She says, well, I don't know. I says, well, I think so. I sense it. That's the discerning of spirit, whether it's of God or not of God. Amen. And see, we're supposed to develop those things. That all those nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, those spiritual attributes that God wants to work through every one of His children, that we will be able to know and discern whatever's going on around us. When, in the book of Acts, where Paul was preaching, and, and uh, excuse me, 
a man, seven sons of Seba was going to cast a demon out. And that demon rose up and spoke, and it's recorded in the book of Acts. It said, Paul I know, and Jesus I know, but who in the world are you? <laughs> and the Bible says, one man leaped on seven and tore their clothes off of them, and they fled, torn up and, and, and messed up. Supernatural power. Oh, the devil can do a lot of things, ladies and gentlemen, but there's one thing that he will be forced to do one day, and that's bow to the name of Jesus Christ. And you can make him bow when you've spent time with the Lord yourself. You spend time with the Lord, that anointing is upon you to do the works of Jesus, because that's what Jesus said. The works that I do shall you do, and greater works than these shall you do. And ladies and gentlemen, that's us. That's not the preacher. That's us, all of us, the disciples. We are to do the works of Jesus because the world is sitting in darkness. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible tells us that it was through strong crying and tears that Jesus cried out to the Father that when He died, He wouldn't stay dead. Come on! But because He had dotted the, uh, He had crossed the T's and dotted the I's as a human, and God saw that He was righteous. Even Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, who is the Son of God, who is God in the flesh, even Jesus, as a human, had to walk the line. As a, why? As an example to us that if He can do it with God's help, we can too. Come on! If He can do it, we can too. We say, oh, that's too hard. I'm not a disciple. I'm not... Well, then you better get saved. How many been in the military? Oh, look here. Once you did that with your hand up, was your life your own? Could you do whatever you wanted to? Could you go where you wanted to? Could you walk around here, there, wherever? I worked with an electrician when I was in uh, second year. I was probably about 18 years old. And he'd been in the Navy out here at uh, Naval Air Station. And he was in the Navy for 36 months. Because of, but because of who he was and how he acted, he spent 18 months of that 36 months in the brig. Yeah. Because when he was not going to submit to authority. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, when you join the military, you have given them your life. And they can do what they want to with it. They can keep you up for four days at a time with no sleep and you'll be a zombie. And it's perfectly all right if they need you to do that because it's in the military and they have that right to do it. They can even take you out and execute you if they need to. They can send you into harm's way where they know you're going to get killed because when you did that, you belong to them. Did you ever get bullets at you, Perry? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's in Vietnam. Uh-huh. He got shot at. Uh-huh. Well, we get shot at, too. We get shot at, too. Because we're in God's military, and our lives are not our own. They have been bought, 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 say bought. Bought with a price of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. You either belong to the devil or you belong to God. And if you belong to God, we're required to obey Him. Yes, yes, yes. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Are you an overcomer? Amen. Yes, you are. That's the title God puts on you. Now, you may not be overcoming the way you're supposed to. You may be lacking. You may be slack. But you need to buck up and show up. Amen? Amen. You need to be there. 
Now, yes, praise God, you're here this morning. Hallelujah. I found out years ago that uh, when I go to preach, if it's just one person here, I'm still required to preach. <laughs> That's my calling from God. And I, I remember when he called me to do it. I said, Lord, this is me. This is me. He said, That's all right. I will qualify you. Because I wasn't qualified. None of us are. If you're waiting to get qualified, you won't serve God doing anything. Amen. That's true. But when you, when you say yes to Him, and that's what you have to do, is say, Yes, Lord, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee I owe. Yes, yes, yes. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God's planning a wedding. Did you know that? Amen. Yes, He is. He's planning a wedding, and He intends on us to be there. In the meantime, we have a work and a job to do, and that is to lead other people into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You know, if you go down through those seven churches that are listed there, at the end of every one, I don't care how much he rebuked them or how much he chastened them with his words or he commended them. There were several that he really did commend. He will give an admonition to the person that overcomes. And we have to overcome all the way to the end. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To he that overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. To the one that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that receives it. He that overcomes and keeps my work to the end will I give power over the nations. See, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to be sitting up in heaven plucking on a harp. Amen. Come on. He, God's going to put you to work. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Why do you think you're going through boot camp right now? That's right. Huh? Next thousand years, finishing school. That's what it is. For us with the world. Do you know that sinners will be sinners still during the next thousand years? Yeah, the Bible even tells us in Zechariah 14 of the punishment to those that will, won't go up and worship the Lord on the day of tabernacle, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. And they won't get any rain, so they'll have no food because they can't grow any crops because they're disobedient. And we're he here, and He will assign you here and here and here and here, depending upon the, the works that you do now. Did you hear me? Amen. Depending upon what you do now, the more you serve the Lord and obey the Lord, it will be counted for reward for you on that day when He judges us. And He will pass out crowns. Five different kinds of crowns, ladies and gentlemen. Five different ones. And they, as you gain and do those things of the Lord, those crowns, when the Lord gives them to you and puts them on your head, those crowns interlock and they enhance the beauty of the one that was before with the beauty of the one that comes on. And they will all come together. And the Bible says you will rule with Christ as kings. Do kings wear a crown? Yes. Absolutely. Our king wore a crown. But now he is the King of kings yes, and the Lord of lords. He is a mighty God and he's coming back. He said, I'll give you power over the nations and I will give you power to work with me. He shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of the potter. Shall they be broken in shivers even as I received of my father and I'll give you the morning star. He that overcomes the same will be clothed in white. I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life but will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And he goes on to tell us, ladies and gentlemen, if God, Jesus Christ doesn't confess your name to the father, you will go to hell. You want to make sure their name is written in the Lamb's book of life, right? He that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He'll go out no more. I'll write upon them the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I'll write on him my new name. And he that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. And ladies and gentlemen, those are big throne chairs because I've seen them. 
30 something years ago when God allowed me to spring into the throne room of God I saw those throne chairs that massive throne chairs that go around the throne of God they're huge they're big and I on that white pavement every one of those throne chairs had barefoot footprints walking through that whiteness out of that grayness I wasn't allowed to see all the billions of people and there was footprints coming across that pavement about as wide as this room or maybe wider white as white as white as white can be only it looked like the person had stepped in blood in red paint there was barefoot footprints coming to every single one of those throne chairs. Ladies and gentlemen, for the Son of God to become the King of kings and Lord of lords, He had to shed His blood. Amen. Out of His hands and His feet and His side and His back and His head from all over. And I asked Wednesday night, I said, where's the blood of Jesus right now? And said, in heaven. And it's there before the throne of God right now of a witness and testimony of what Jesus Christ has done. Amen. Forever and ever it will be there before the throne of God signifying and declaring that Jesus paid the price for all. Can you say amen? amen. He said, To he that overcomes will I grant to sit in my throne even as I also overcame. See, he's not asking us to do something that we can't do. He did it too. With God's help and God's grace and God's hand upon him, we can too. 